Hello and welcome to this Red Gaming Tech video, myself and Marta, where as always I'm here with the latest from the tech and gaming world in the last 24 or so hours. We have a few interesting pieces for you today, and we're going to kick things off with something rather interesting regarding PCIe 4. So we actually have a bunch more information about PCIe 4.0, thanks to the fact that PCIe, PCI SIG the group who are behind creating and finalizing future PCI standards had sessions at the Intel Developer Forum in San Francisco last week, and they of course spoke at length about the next step for PCIe. So obviously we've come a long, long way since PCI 1, and with a lot of chatter about PCI 4.0. But the most interesting comments were actually made in an interview between Tom's Hardware and Richard Solomon, who is Vice President of PCI SIG. And the most interesting thing that he discussed here is the fact that PCIe 4.0 is going to provide four times, at least four times increase in power delivery to the slot. So that basically means that we're going to be seeing the power delivered into the slot itself rather than external cables like we do at the moment. Now he couldn't give final numbers for the upper limit for the socket power but the minimum would be at least 300 watts and he did suggest that perhaps we could be seeing the upper limit be possible of about four to 500 watts which is pretty nuts to say the least. Now just to put that in some sort of context for you, the current PCIe 3.0 is only capable of delivering a max of 75 watts, so that is a huge step up, even if you say 300 is the maximum, which it, from what he's saying it won't be, that's going to be the minimum, but even if you just pretend for a minute that's a maximum, that is still a huge increase, and even like the very tip top of the top end could be entirely bus powered even things like the Titan or the 2080 tie could be powered entirely through the bus and we have seen a trend from both AMD and Nvidia to get that TDP down for their graphics cards especially of course to top end. Now obviously this does mean that a PCIe 4.0 motherboard is still going to need extra power so we're still going to be using those power cables that we've been plugging into the GPU this whole time from our PSU, but instead now it's going to be going into the motherboard most likely. So this has a couple of benefits which I feel are minor but can have I'd say, effects on pretty much the life of your of your graphics card especially because the most important thing is like because let's assume that they're going to be plugging into the motherboard directly which would make sense it would just improve airflow you've got all these cables cluttering around the gpu itself so when you've got a card that's putting out quite a bit of heat because especially if it's a top end card and you're running you know 4k games or whatever it's putting out quite a bit of heat even with good cooling and just having better airflow is just better for the longevity of not only a graphics card but of course the rest of the machine as well now obviously it's not just going to be good for graphics cards we are also seeing PCI attached storage becoming a thing because of the amount of bandwidth available so we could be seeing quite a few potential options there and obviously power delivery is not the only thing that PCIe 4.0 is going to bring to the table just for instance for an x16 socket then a PCIe 4.0 GPU is going to have a total of 31.508 GPS second of available bandwidth at its disposal so we should wait and see more information and obviously it's really going to depend on motherboards and uh, the support from AIBs and all that sort of thing but this is still pretty damn interesting and would be a little weird to take your top end graphics card just slot it to the motherboard and call it good instead of having to worry about those six and eight pin connectors that's definitely Cool, but obviously, you know, I'm going to throw a parade in the streets anytime soon about it, but still, the improvement of technology is always fascinating to me. Anyway, we're going to move on now to some benchmarks for the RTX 2060. And these benchmarks come to us thanks to the now infamous leaker, Tom Apisak, who has posted a couple of images of some benchmarks, the first of which being Ashes of the Singularity. So, you can see in the top left corner, Plain as the eye can see, RTX 2060, and we'll see an 8700K as well. And we see the results, which 
alpha 1440p so the average frame rate is what we're interested in here rather than the cpu frame rate given that of course we are we're most interested in the gpu and we see an average frame rate here of 49.1 on all batches that's average across all and then obviously on the normal we see 56.8 48.5 on the medium and then 43.8 on the heavy batch now the next one is unfortunately a bit incomplete and this is actually regarding an rtx 2060 laptop and the reason i say it's incomplete is because apitech himself says it's not final performance this is taken from during the test but the score was hidden for some reason he's saying on the final test i'm not really sure what he means by that but what we see here is an rtx 2060 laptop score leak of roughly 19 and then it says xxx so what those other numbers are is anyone's guess but roughly 19,000 for this 2060 laptop gpu so let me know your thoughts on these ones, guys. Um, unsurprisingly, there are some comments on the results on the Ashes of the Singularity one in particular. Now, I do kind of draw my eye to a certain thing on the Ashes of the Singularity benchmark because it does say the resolution is 0 times 0 So that kind of raises my eyebrow a little bit. So, you know, as always, take these leaks for what they're worth. Take them with a pinch of salt as per usual. That isn't all I have for you today, my friends, with the RTX 2060. Oh, no, no. We actually have, apparently, the full price and performance and as well as the specs leaked for the RTX 2060 thanks to a reviewer's guide which fell into the hands of videocards.com of course I'm going to link their article in the description below this video so let's get stuck in shall we so in terms of the specs we're going to be seeing 1920 CUDA cores 240 tensor cores 30 RT cores 120 TMUs and 48 ROPs in terms of the boost clocks, we're going to be seeing 1680 MHz, and that's actually going to be the same across the board, regardless if it's reference or founder's edition, but obviously you can expect the usual factory overclocked editions from AIBs and so on and so forth. And according to the very same guy that Video Cards has gotten this information from, we're going to be seeing comparable performance to that of the 1070 Ti. So what about the performance, I hear you ask? Well, we have some performance numbers, the first of which is actually going to be Battlefield 5 on 1080p, and with RT off, it's hitting 90 FPS, with RT on but DLSS off, it's 65, and then RT on and DLSS on, we're seeing 88 frames per second, but that's not the only performance numbers we actually have, oh no, by any means. There is a metric ton of performance numbers, of course I'm going to include, again, the link to the article in the description below this video if you want to give the full sort of breadth of games a look see i would highly recommend you do so i'm just going to pick a few like for example we have ashes singularity escalation we see 55 frames per second we see the same numbers of battlefield 5 that i've already mentioned hitman 2 has got 84 we've got rise of the tomb raider coming in at 79 shadow of the tomb raider coming in at 59 the Witcher 3 coming at 222 frames per second, Wolfenstein 2 is 138, uh, the Superposition graphics card benchmark is 77 frames per second, Doom is 154, just a few, and those are 1080p numbers by the way, in terms of 1440p we see 48 frames per second for Ashes and Singularity which lines up pretty much perfectly with the... Uh, previous benchmarks from Tom Apitech that I just discussed, we see 114 frames per second for Battlefield 1, uh, 108 frames per second for Doom, 78 frames per second for Hitman 2, Rise of the Tomb Raider is 50, Shadow of the Tomb Raider is 38, Wolfenstein 2 is 94, Superposition gets 19 here, so it gets a bit hammered by that, but that's obviously a benchmark. So there you have it guys, the leaks and what we've seen are pretty much matching up with what we are seeing here in terms of these performance numbers. So just to give you a bit of sort of context for those, that was on a 7900X i9 with 16 gigabytes of RAM. And in terms of the price, which of course is the all important question, especially with the Turing series, given how expensive this series has actually been, we're going to be seeing $349 US. And that is going to be the same price for both custom and founders editions. And it's actually going to be bundled with either Battlefield 5 or Anthem. Do forgive that dinging in the background there. That's just my dinner telling me that it's ready. Anyway. <laughs> so now we're going to move on from that to the gaming news. And the first of which is regarding one of my favourite developers from software. Now, of course, their next game is Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, and I am so down for that. It looks really, really good. To be honest, I'd be down for pretty much anything they made. If they made a cooking simulator, I would probably play it. 
But, of course, they are undoubtedly working on other things as well. And in a recent interview with the Japanese site 4Gamer, the president, Hidetaka Miyazaki, confirmed that two more games are currently in development over at From Software. Now, he didn't really give any details, unsurprisingly, this is Miyazaki we're talking about here, I'd be surprised if he did give information, but he was keen to point out that these are not remakes, so this isn't Metal Metal Wolf Chaos XD or whatever, or a remaster like that, because those were outsourced, that being that, and Dark Souls remastered to outside developers for the actual remastering. According to Miyazaki, they're, quote, both From Software-esque games. So, whatever that means, it's hard to say. Of course, you think of From Software as game, you think Dark Souls, you think Bloodborne, but obviously that's kind of what put them on the map in recent years, but they have quite a varied back catalogue of games. So, obviously, numerous things and guesses are popping up in your head, and I know there are in mine, so... And another one, another one of them is um, probably one of the most common of them, I suppose you should say, it's probably Bloodborne 2, but I wouldn't really get your hopes up for that one, in all honesty. There's a bit of hype recently, just due to some things in the game Derecine, that they were actually actively working on Bloodborne 2, but while he didn't deny that it's ever going to come out, he didn't flat out say, no, we're never going to make Bloodborne 2, he did say that the Easter egg in Derecine was not referencing that we're going to la- that they were going to launch Bloodborne 2, so he, did, he was keen to kind of tamp down those flames, but to be honest, I would be surprised to see them not do something else in that universe, I would happily play a Bloodborne 2, and I'm sure Sony would love to get them a huge stack of cash to make them another game for the PS5 this time around and that would make perfect sense if you ask me that's probably long enough for them to develop it given that we're hearing rumors of 2019 slash 2020 release date for the PS5 so these could literally be anything known from software there could be Bloodborne 2 it could be a Souls like game but not a Souls game if you get what I mean or it could be something completely different you know maybe it's going to be Another Armored Core game, just for instance, you know, that could entirely be possible, or it could be new IPs just completely. So, let the speculation commence, and we're going to finish things up with the official top sellers of 2018. And what do I mean by that here, you ask? Well, it's the Steam Best of 2018 top sellers. Now, these are as measured by gross revenue. Now, I will say I am torn on whether or not I'm going to be doing a top five of the year list this year, um, to be honest. I, I'm going to see, I'm going to try writing it and seeing what happens, because this year, while it's had some very good games, is nowhere near as good as last year, in my personal opinion. So, we'll see how it goes. Regardless, so what do we actually see? Well, we have several categories, of which I'm not going to go through them all, because I'll be here until next Christmas. But we have Platinum, Gold, and Silver. Bronze has a ton of games in it, so I'm not going to do those. So what do we actually see in the Platinum category? Well, GTA V is in there, unsurprisingly. Civ VI, Rainbow Six Siege, Far Cry 5, Elder Scrolls Online, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Monster Hunter World, CSGO Danger Zone, and Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, Dota 2, Rocket League, Warframe, and in gold we see Divinity Original Sin 2, The Witcher Wild Hunt, Path of Exile, Betrayal, Black Desert Online, Assassin's Creed Origins, Kingdom Come Deliverance, Dead by Daylight, Jurassic World Evolution, Warhammer, Ark Survival Evolved, Stellaris, and Cities Skylines in that. And then in silver, we see Dying Light, Ghost Recon, Raft, Subnautica, Euro Truck Simulator 2, War Thunder, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, The Forest, Scum, Dragon Fighter Z, oh, sorry, Dragon Ball Fighter Z, No Man's Sky, Team Fortress 2, Frostpunk, Final Fantasy 15 PC edition, of course, Fallout 4, and Warhammer Vermintide 2. And there is a metric ton of games in the bronze category, but I'm just going to give you a flu, a, a flu, a few of them that are there, we, we see Slay the Spire, we see Shadow of War, we see Dark Souls 3, Rise of the Tomb Raider, Soul Calibur 6, Sims 3, uh, Surviving Mars, Dark Souls Remastered, XCOM 2, They Are Billions, Darkest Dungeon, Star Wars Jew Valley, you know, there's some really, really good games there. So we see some fair, a fair few new entries there, but a lot of old favourites as well, like PUBG, Dota 2, Rocket League, GTA 5, and so on and so forth, but a lot of newer games there, but... I think it speaks volumes about this year in terms of games, that a lot of the games that are in the top sellers are games that either came out at the start of the year or actually are from last year or even prior to that. So yeah, torn on whether or not I'm going to be doing a video this year, guys, but um, we'll see how it goes when I actually sit down to write it, because I haven't actually had time. Anyway, that is me done for this video. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.